my name is Dr. Cinta Scott. And first and foremost, I'm a marine biologist. I actually live and work in a region of Panama on the Caribbean coast, and it is called Bocas del Toro. Well, as a marine biologist, um, I do some studies and some investigations in the ocean here, particularly looking at mangroves, which are salt tolerant trees that uh, you find here throughout the archipelago. And um, I also am the director of a study abroad program here on the island of Isla Colón. We normally receive students, about 24 university students from the United States, and they come to our program, uh, which is part of the School for Field Studies. And they study here and do a whole semester's worth of their work, and they receive credit for being here. And they study marine and terrestrial ecology, as well as socioeconomics. I feel like so many times people think that there is this so-called pipeline, right? You're supposed to do all of these things and then you magically become a marine biologist, but that just isn't the case. And for me, that wasn't the case. And for so many people, I think it's not the case. We kind of wind up in these careers or in these, these areas, these specialized areas by accident. And so when I was younger, I really wanted to be a veterinarian. But then one day I thought, well, maybe I should actually do an internship and see if I want to be a veterinarian. <laughs> and I did. I did a small animal internship and a large veterinary internship, large animal. And I found out that I didn't want to be a veterinarian. And so then I switched and I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. And then I just thought, no, this is not what I want to do. I think internships are one of the most important things anybody can do because importantly, it tells you what you love. But even more importantly, it tells you what you don't like, right? And that is so important. <laughs> I grew up in the suburbs of Boston. And when I was younger, I had opportunities to go to the beach a lot. And um, I went to summer camp in Maine. So I was always near a lake. And I always had an affinity to the water. Um, but I didn't really understand the human connection to the water and to the ocean until I was in college, until university. I had the opportunity to do a research experience for undergraduates. It's called an REU. And that changed my life forever. I was able to work under the guidance of, actually, he's a medical doctor. He was studying a, a disease in humans, cystic fibrosis. But I didn't even know that you could study sharks to figure out issues that were happening with the disease cystic fibrosis. And so I was introduced to molecular biology and to fish physiology and to sharks and all these amazing things at this REU. And then also in my third year of university, I studied abroad in Costa Rica. And that's where I got trained uh, to scuba dive. And uh, that also forever changed my life because I had no idea there was this whole world underwater that, you know, for my whole life up until that point, I hadn't even seen. I couldn't believe it. Well, so I went to Middlebury College in Vermont and Vermont is landlocked. <laughs> And I became a marine biologist, right? So um, just because you're going to school somewhere where you don't have access to the ocean and you want to be a marine biologist doesn't mean you can't become that, right? Uh, and luckily I had excellent training uh, at my undergraduate university because I was able to study environmental studies, right? Which is all encompassing. So I was able to do a joint major. It was in environmental studies and in biology. And then I minored in Spanish. And I will say it is so very important when you're in the field of marine biology, especially to be able to speak a second language. Whatever language you might speak, it I think it will advance you. It will only advance you to be able to go to places that you never imagined that you'd be able to go. I definitely think the community work that I get to do and connecting young people to the ocean, connecting people who've lived here their whole lives, but maybe don't know how to swim or who've never snorkeled or who haven't been out on a reef before. I love taking kids out and university students out 
I also get great joy and satisfaction from seeing my own students enter, some of them never having been in the ocean. And then you get to see them go into the mangroves and go out over a coral reef. And then they get to do um, research and seeing them progress from beginning to end in a short period of time really makes me just overjoyed and happy for them. Normally, I would wake up around seven o'clock or 6.30 and, you know, we have a group breakfast together and then um, the students have a meeting where they're told the schedule of the day. And while they're meeting, I have a staff meeting and we go through the schedule of the day and we make sure the boats are going to arrive, that um, the, the, the guy who's going to do the trail guide that day is, is going to arrive on time. Uh, we make sure all the equipment, all the coolers, everything's ready to go. And making sure that the faculty have the support they need to support students in the field. And then uh, we do the safety checks and make sure we have the medical kits. And then we all go out into the field. And usually if we have a group of 20 students, we'll split 10 students that go into the forest, the rainforest first. And then we have 10 students that might do something in the water. And we do activities in the mornings usually, we come back, we have lunch, and then it's lectures and classwork in the afternoon, maybe some small group work, and then we have dinner, and then there might be an evening activity or students might choose to go to town. Um, but every day is so different, which is why I love my work because you just never know what you're gonna get on any day. Definitely leadership and um, understanding every single person's role in your team. So what does that mean? It means we have cooks, for example. Well, we've had moments where none of our cooks could come to work and guess who cooked? <laughs> you have to be able to do every job on, on your team and you have to have respect and, and love and care for every person on your team and respect the work that they're doing. We call it intellectual humility, right? It's knowing that you're never the smartest person in any room and nor should you want to be, you know? I think it's so important to learn from every person you can, no matter what age and no matter what education level, everyone has something to offer. In marine biology, you can go into so many different areas. So you have, for example, fisheries. What are the fish stocks like? How many tuna are there in the ocean? Who's tracking this? And are we overfishing and depleting these natural resources? You could go into coral reef ecology. Um, how many different species of coral are there? And are they declining? Have there been recent coral bleaching events that need to be documented? How important is coral for supporting the fishing industry? Because fish depend on coral reefs, right? So you could also go into uh, oceanography or into deep sea studies. There's also the whole molecular and genetic side, right? So when we talk about, let's say coral restoration, well, how do you know where to put a coral back out onto a reef? And genetically, what, What's happening with that? Is it going to impact the corals that are already there? Of course, you have people doing wonderful things with the larger um, animals, especially larger fish like sharks. And then you have people doing work with mammals such as whales and, you know, so it, it's very diverse. And then also you have the turtle people and the, the, the whale shark people, and you have the manta ray people and, and the dolphin people and everybody very concerned about all of these, these different animals that are under serious threat because the basis of these habitats that they live in is eroding. So population biology, evolutionary ecology, genetics, um, physical oceanography, chemical oceanography, geology, all of that is combined in marine biology. I think learn as much as you possibly can about what you're interested in. Because a lot of times students will come to me and they'll say, oh, I really love the ocean. And I think it takes a bit of time to figure out, well, what do you love about the ocean? What is it that makes you excited about it? 
is it the fish or is it the coral or is it turtles or maybe you're interested in conservation in protecting these these habitats and organisms and i would say the first step is trying to figure out what do you love about the marine environment and why are you interested in that Well, I know that there are a lot of different um, programs that you can actually go on uh, and you can go abroad. And there are entities like CIEE that take middle and high school students out and, and to do all these different kinds of um, exploratory studies in, in marine biology, for example. In terms of books, I think it's important to read The Sixth Extinction. We're at a crossroads right now as a human population and, and our, our impact on the natural world. And I really think it's important to have a good understanding of, of what's happening and the decline, the rapid decline of some of the biodiversity. So, you know, you need to educate yourself about overfishing. So when you go to the grocery store with your parents, understand that the choices that you make in the seafood that you eat have a direct impact on people in other places in the world. Know where the fish that you're eating is coming from. Are you, you know, inadvertently supporting bycatch that's ecologically important in the marine community? Are you causing more damage by eating these things than good? I think it's also important to read up on not only just your, your, your impacts through the food that you eat, but the things that you consume. So making sure that whatever you buy is sustainably made and not just sustainably made, but is ethical. It's difficult because you can't necessarily see the global impact of our consumer choices. And I see it here because I live on an island that has two roads. And yet here on the islands, we see a lot of ecological devastation in the water. We are, we're having a coral bleaching event right now where we're losing a lot of corals. But again, why is this happening in a place that doesn't have a huge population and doesn't have a lot of cars? Well, because we're globally connected and every choice that you make affects the people in Panama. And the people in Panama, when they make a choice, it affects the people in Brazil, and, and it's all circular. You know, it's really easy for biologists to say, we need to conserve biodiversity, right? We say this all the time. What happens oddly is that um, we don't tend to value the diversity of people as much as we value biodiversity. And I think I was always very perplexed by this when I was going through school uh, particularly during my graduate career and doing my PhD, where I would look around and I would be the only Black person in my classes and I didn't see me represented in the faculty or in the higher administration. And so my motivation for building equity in the ocean sciences stems from my own experience of not having anyone around who looked like me. And why? Why, why are our voices excluded? And I think it's really important that everybody's voice gets heard. Having lived outside of the US now for six years, I can now see how the messaging that we sometimes receive in the US about being a minority in STEM just can make you feel like you don't belong or that it's not meant for you. And really it is. And it's all in your head. You just have to go for it and ignore everything else. So no matter what it is, whether it's ocean sciences, marine biology, or if it's engineering, I mean, again, it's about having support and having the confidence and just going for it and reaching your goal.